So um, next, I, it's my great pleasure to in, invite Jane Draper um, to speak on her talk uh, about ICC screening and outflow tract obstruction clinics. So Jane is actually a clinical scientist at Guy's and St. Thomas's. Um, she has a fascinating background who started initially as a physiologist and, and then through additional training that she underwent, she became a clinical scientist and I'm sure not many of us have clinical scientists in post. Um, so, so Jane really has been quite inspirational in this area. Um, she's also set up and, and actually leads the ICC screening clinic uh, at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. So um, it's great pleasure, Jane. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much for your talk in advance. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? OK, we can indeed. Thank you, Jane. Perfect. And my slides are sharing OK. They are lovely. Perfect. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to talk to you all today about our um, scientist services that we have at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, just as an overview, I'm just going to explain a little bit about who we are as clinical scientists and where I think we should fit into the multidisciplinary team within inherited cardiac conditions. And then just go through our screening clinic in a bit more detail, why we set it up, who we see, how we run it, and a little bit of data and experience from, from running that clinic for just about four years now. Um, and then just sort of touch on what we've been doing to be sort of match fit and ready for um, Mavacampton for when it when it hits the hospital floors and then just go through a, a summary uh, of the main points. Um, so who are clinical scientists and where do we fit in into the services? Uh, so in terms of uh, clinical scientists, it's, it's worth pointing out just to start off with actually that they do exist in different um, healthcare uh, professions. So for this talk, I'm talking about clinical scientists within cardiology and specifically sort of cardiac sciences. And I think we're a little bit late to the clinical scientist party, but we're, we are essentially your cardiac physiologist with a slightly different jacket on. Um, the difference between physiology and uh, scientists is that we are registered with the Health and Care Professionals Council. So traditionally, from a physiology point of view, um, within specialties, you'll have your external accreditation, be it uh, with BSE or if you're in devices with, with the other various accreditations in that specialty. Um, but cardiac physiology, as it stands, is not a state registered profession. And I think state registration really helps from a professional point of view. We've got standards for training and practice. It improves clinical government governance and then uh, as a whole of that, there's improved patient safety for when we're reviewing patients. Um, there's a couple of ways of becoming a, a clinical scientist. So the Academy of Healthcare Sciences uh, has a now a training program at master's level, and I think that's sort of three to four years. Or if you're a bit grey around the edges like me, you can go through an equivalence process. Um, what it's also done is sort of embed uh, advanced practice into our roles. Uh, and in terms of advanced practice, I'm talking about clinical assessment, um, and which allows the review of certain patient groups. Uh, and we can give advice and treatments and follow ups of these of these patient groups. Uh, so where do we fit in in terms of the MDT? I think we're often pretty under recognized and underutilized, actually. So we've got the uh, the ESE guidelines from 2023 here in terms of uh, how they see an MDT um, fitting together. Uh, you can't see cardiac scientists or, or physiologists on there. I think maybe we sort of fit into the other related experts as an imaging team. Um, but I would argue, actually, if you think about your patient pathway within ICC, how many uh, contacts they have with us we, you'll have you'll definitely get an ECG you'll probably do a 24-hour monitor there'll be a treadmill maybe a CPET there'll be echoes there'll be repeat echoes if there's devices there'll be follow-ups and all of that fits into the skills uh, within physiology or scientists because we don't only perform those but we have specialist knowledge in interpreting uh, these tests. So from my perspective, I feel that actually we, we fit in pretty well here with the cardiomyopathy special, specialists in there with the specialist nurses and the genetic counsellors. Uh, I think we have something real to offer the ICC patients. And given the amount of patient contacts we have, the idea of setting up these services to try and maximise uh, the efficiency of reviewing patients within these services. Uh, so 
in terms of why we need these services, I've just touched upon that. But we, if we look at the the state of cardiomyopathy care from the National um, Cardiomyopathy Report in 2023, we're, in, in England, we're not actually doing that well. Patients aren't really getting the appropriate care for, at, at a primary level. GPs are struggling to identify potential cardiomyopathies and often miss the diagnosis. And certainly since the pandemics, uh, the waiting lists have been uh, increasing. Current NHS England uh, recommendations are that people with suspected cardiomyopathy are referred to cardiology specialty or inherited cardiac conditions services. We know we need to see these patients because the sooner we see them, we do improve outcomes. And we also have to remember that pretty much with every diagnosis, it does initiate family screening. So we've got a large number of patients. Waiting lists are at an all-time high. And if we're completely honest, staff retention, recruitment and morale within the NHS at this at this time is um, uh, probably at an all time low, if we were to be honest. So this led us to sort of look at developing a screening clinic. As I say, we, we actually see your patients a lot within, science, within cardiac sciences. We're going to be doing an echo. So why not do that a little bit more? So actually that visit is, is ben benefiting the patient to the maximum possible uh, point. So we know that uh, cardiomyopathies have a, 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 an inherited uh, aspect to it. Guidelines tell us that we need to screen um, family members, and that's usually with an ECG and imaging. Given availability and costs, ECHO is usually the first line port of call from that. So we've got ECG and ECHO that's required, which fits really well into what scientists do. You add, add in the ability to do a clinical assessment and actually this patient cohort can be seen very simply and, and safely within scientist services. So who we see, uh, it's worth, this has changed a bit since, since we first started the clinic. We've done continuous audit and, and, and review of the service since we set it up. So these criteria have changed a little bit to, to maximize the patient safety and to make sure that we review the correct people. So it's set up as asymptomatic first degree relatives of patients with hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, we are now, when we first started, that was just genotype negative patients, but we now see the genotype positive as long as they're phenotype negative in this, in this service as well. Uh, we have an age uh, range and we ask for no pre-existing cardiovascular disease. And that's when we first set up, when we started seeing anybody referred for, for family screening, those with multiple comorbidities or other um, like hypertension or angina, they're actually better suited to be, be seen by a, a consultant cardiologist. So this is our screening clinic uh, pathway. So I'll talk a little bit about the training that we've done in order to make sure that that we're we're ready for this. So our scientists are, are band seven or above, and we've got at least five years experience in, in accredited ECHO. As I've mentioned, we're state registered with the HCPC. In addition to that state registration, we, we ask people to do an MSc level clinical skills course so that we know that we can assess patients uh, appropriately and safely. Um, now, the next two are points there so th these are the ones that can be a bit tricky when you're setting it up so the one-to-one -one training so you have to have a little bit of time investment from consultants at this point uh, what we've done is we, we arrange time for for our scientists to sit in clinics or attend ward rounds to make sure that they uh, are able to assess patients and align their follow-up and recommendations with with guidelines and and consultant review. So there isn't a difference between if these patients see a consultant or a scientist. The other thing is is an IT issue really. If if you're not a doctor and you're not a nurse, sometimes getting ordering rights to certain. Uh, tests, particularly bloods or MRI, uh, can be quite challenging. Um, so you need to set up documents uh, within your department to be able to do this. So just looking at our data. So as I say, we've been going for about four years on and off for a few stop starts with the uh, COVID lockdowns. And this is just some data from the first 200 patients that uh, we've seen. Um, 116 of them come through a self-referral uh, pathway. Uh, we have a, a wonderful 
team of genetic nurses at Guy's and St Thomas's who organise and and look after these self-referrals. They do triaging and those that fit the criteria for the screening clinic are, are then pushed in to, to see uh, the, the scientists, those that are more high risk, uh, go into consultant services. Uh, so of these 200 patients, we found that 169 of them had normal screens. 31 were identified to have uh, abnormalities in echo or, or ECG that want, warranted further investigations, and that, that was normally an, an MRI. And 21 of those were then identified with early phenotypic changes um, and were followed up in consultant services. Uh, the split between uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was pretty even. Um, uh, the age ranges, there, there was not a huge amount of difference there, and pretty even split between male and female. You can see the, the graph at the bottom there just shows the percentage of abnormal screens with, between the probands with DCM or HCM with slightly more abnormalities found within the dilated cardiomyopathy group. Interestingly, absolutely none of the patients reported any red flag symptoms, um, which just sort of goes to highlight the importance of, of screening because often these individuals are well and asymptomatic. So uh, don't often present to uh, healthcare professionals in the first place. Uh, we had one admission from clinic. There was a 36 year old male um, who was asymptomatic. He presented with complete heart block on his ECG and his echo demonstrated dilated LV with a borderline sort of mildly impaired ejection fraction of 53% on his echo. Uh, so we admitted him and he was subsequently found to have a pathogenic variant within the lamin AC gene. So the screening clinic benefits. Um, so it alleviates pressures on the consultant services and it provides an alternative pathway for review. Um, it, it, it's better than just getting an echo and an ECG referred to by the GP because the patients get the full review and informed of the results and the, the follow up at the same time. It also removes these well asymptomatic patients from consultants lists who, because they are well and asymptomatic, often don't get prioritised clinically. Um, so they often end up waiting to be seen for a lot longer. By taking these patients out of consultant services, that allows the consultants to see the higher risk referrals um, and the symptomatic patients. And also, if the screen is positive, when we then refer them back into the consultant services, they will have had all the diagnostics done. So that is, should then just be a one-stop a one uh, clinic appointment for review of, of all the results. So as I said, we see that we get to see the patient sooner. I think uh, the data sort of shows that on a month to month comparison, we, we see patients within two months, which is at least a month earlier than in, within consultant services. And also by seeing the patient sooner, I think we obviously can alleviate the anxiety of waiting. A lot of these referrals are triggered by sudden death within families. So hanging around and waiting months to be seen can obviously cause quite a lot of psychological uh, trauma. Uh, not to advertise it too much, but we are a bit cheaper. The NHS does care about these things. Um, so you get clinical activity and income without a consultant salary. Uh, and we don't see that this is a loss in echo activity because the scientists are doing echoes that would have already been, uh, re have already been referred. So they're going to have to be doing these scans anyway. You might as well just make that, that visit a little bit more comprehensive for the patients. It's a, uh, this service aligns with the NHS long-term plan. It fits the one-stop shop model that NHS England likes. It's looking for different ways of working um, and can actually quite easily be transported into, pri into the primary care or community uh, settings uh, with the appropriate IT setup. Giving, giving scientists or physiologists the opportunity to do advanced practice and, and a career progression will also help with staff retention within cardiac sciences, which is uh, a pretty uh, difficult place to recruit into at the, uh, the present. So moving on just to uh, what we're going to do for our Mavacampton patients. I'm not going to go into what Mavacampton is, but uh, Dr. Halliday's always gone, already been through uh, that in, in nice detail. But 
the messages from the data is that this drug is going to be wonderful, but we do have to be very cautious about monitoring LV function in the patients once they've been identified as suitable. So the decisions for drug, drug tri sorry, drug titrations um, are going to be guided by ejection fraction and outflow track gradients. So, uh, and given that these are likely to be echo decisions along with obviously the symptoms and the clinical review of the patient, again, these patients seem to fit quite nicely into a clinical scientist uh, service. There are similarities between Mavacampton and uh, certain cancer therapy treatments, um, and we have a a scientist-led cardio-oncology service, and we've sort of pulled in our experience from, from there to try and set up and, and inform what we're going to do for our Mavacampton patients. So uh, this is from the Kamsaya's prescription information leaflet, just in terms of how often we're going to need to be seeing these patients once they have been uh, identified and initiated on, on Mavacampton. So Best case scenario, it's three appointments in the first month of initiation. Um, and, and if it all is well then after week 12, it is every three months from there on. And I'm not sure that we are currently sure of how long those three months echoes are going to have to be going to have to continue. Um, if there is a drop in the ejection fraction to below 50%, then it's recommended that they that patients are seen every four weeks until we see a recovery in that. Now, I don't know an echo department that's going to be able to incorporate these time sensitive critical um, echo requests. And equally, I'm not entirely sure that our consultant capacity for clinic, clinic review is, is there either. So we have some issues from how we're going to incorporate the, these Mavacampton patients and, and review them safely. It's very difficult to request echoes and then fit those in in a time critical manner and then also marry those up with uh, consultant appointments. Often what happens is the echoes will happen on a different day um, and, and, then, and then you have a delay in the results going back to consultants and, and which results in delays in, in treatment. Uh, the other issue with e echoes being sort of crammed into already busy lists when they're time critical is that you get a, get multiple sonographers. It's not a focused list. It's not a dedicated list, uh, and and small changes in injection fraction, which are very important for this patient cohort, might not seem so important for a sonographer just trying to fit fit in an extra in a busy list. So you get variability in the assessment of LV function and, and, and also they don't focus on the report in terms of how important this is for the patient going forward so it might not be flagged as something that they need to highlight to the referrer. So the lessons that we have from our cardio-oncology service, um, we sort of counter all of these problems. So we have dedicated appointment slots that has the capacity for timely follow-up you just have to request the clinic visit because the echo happens at the same time in one room with one appointment. We deal with the the, the findings of the echo and the ECGs at, at the time that we see the patient um, and we have a small number of, of sonographers co covering these clinics so we're really tuned and tuned in and, and know that we're looking for small reductions in injection fractions and how important that can be. So it makes for more accurate echo reporting and less intra-observer variability. So our plans from the Mavacampton Clinic, so once patients are eligible, identified as eligible, ideally with the, the, the SIP test done beforehand, they'll be referred from our consultant services and then they come into our um, clinical scientist pathway for the next 12 months. So we will then take over the initiation uh, and the up titration and, and maintenance of, of Mavacampton. We're going to be using a digital health platform just to allow continuous contact and, and symptoms check. Um, and then within 12 months, the annual review for, for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients that you would all normally have within consultant clinics is maintained, but they will come back to you hopefully uh, well and um, up titrated on Mavacampton to their, their optimal dose. 
So just in summary, I hope I've sort of uh, identified that the clinical scientists can offer just a bit more than the ECHO reports to within the ICC services. Um, we really help with waiting lists and our, we all know our patient population is, do, is getting bigger, uh, not smaller. We have to do this as part of a, a multidisciplinary team. The services we set up, we have the genetic nurse specialists feeding into them and we have supervising consultants that, that, that are there to offer support and advice and guidance, um, running clinics alongside us uh, and that really is the key to the, the success here. Uh, as I said, it aligns with the NHS long-term plan, um, the one-stop shop. Patients get seen uh, quicker, they get all their diagnostics in one go and they get the results on the, on the same day. Uh, identifying the right patients to see is key. Uh, we found, as I said earlier, if, if you're seeing patients that are too complex, like I, we, there's no point putting somebody into a clinic to see to me th that needs a detailed conversation about whether an ICD is is necessary or they've also got chest pain and they, they might need an angio. Th those patients have to remain within the specialist services under consultant's care. But the younger, fitter, asymptomatic screening patients uh, really are well suited to, to review by clinical scientists. So the triage uh, and the the time spent on making sure you're seeing the right patients is, is really a, one of the key to successes. Um, and then finally, I think there is a time commitment commitment here at, at setup. You need time to do the training with the physiologist or scientist. And I would recommend that when you first start clinics, you give a slightly extended clinic appointment time. You have to remember you're going to be seeing these patients and doing an echo. Uh, so you need to give uh, the scientists a bit of time to be able to do that. But as they become more uh, confident and more efficient, uh, then uh, those clinic appointment times can be reduced. Uh, and the clinic becomes much more productive. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's me. Great. Thank you very much, Jane, uh, for this fantastic overview um, and this insight of this uh, valuable clinical scientist services as actually a pillar of the ICC and HI services. Um, this highlights also how important is the multidisciplinary management of the patients and their families in and out of the hospital. Principle was actually the matrix of the new ICC guidelines. Um, also very informative was the part of the new treatments uh, and indeed some challenges there and questions that still uh, exist. Um, and I will ask everyone to drop their questions uh, on the chat. Uh, so thank you very much. Please stay if you can for the questions part.